Welcome and hello everyone. Um, my name is Mira Debs and I am the Executive Director of Yale's Education Studies Program. We're so glad that you're here. The Yale Education Studies Program is an interdisciplinary community that empowers students and researchers to critically examine and collectively reshape the education landscape through research, policy, and practice. In our conversation this evening, over the next hour, we're going to focus on the role of student activism and the media in addressing educational injustice, and specifically uh, the enduring school segregation in New York City, the nation's largest school district, home to 1.1 million students. New York City has an elaborate school choice system, primarily for middle and high school students, with a lot of schools um, that have screened admissions um, where student test scores, student grades, GPAs, um, attendance, um, sometimes interviews and portfolios um, are all factored into admissions decisions. There also is a gifted and talented program um, and there's a test for that starting when students are four years old. So as a result of, of these screens, an enduring problem in New York City is that the most elite schools um, are disproportionately white and Asian in a district that is majority black and Latinx students. And so as you'll learn this evening, uh, students have been fighting for over 50 years to integrate New York City schools. In 1964, the largest civil rights demonstration uh, during the civil rights movement, 464,000 students um, participated in a walkout protesting the segregated schools of New York City. And in the last decade, the topic of school integration um, with the help of student activists from organizations, including Teens Take Charge and Integrate New York City, um, have been integral in pushing this issue back to the center of the education agenda. Um, the students have also focused not only on integration, but educational self-determination in empowering students um, to determine alongside with their communities an equitable future. You may be wondering, why focus on school integration right now? We're in the middle of a pandemic. Many schools are closed, students are out of school. So why this issue right now? As I've heard repeatedly from students and parents, and I'm currently doing research with um, Molly Macris and Elise Castillo on, on this topic, this issue is only more urgent right now. The pandemic has made inequality between neighborhoods and between communities and schools even more apparent. There is no going back to the way things were. And in the last two months, there has been some significant progress in terms of announcements from the mayor and the school's chancellor regarding uh, middle school screens, um, some high school admissions and a change to the gifted and talented test. So there's momentum and change happening um, right now, even in the middle of the pandemic. Um, a few notes on logistics before we get started. Um, our panel discussion is going to run about 35 minutes, and then we will have time for questions. And you can submit a question at any time via the Q&A tab in the bottom of your screen. Um, and it is now uh, my honor to pass the baton to our moderator, Sarah Medina Kamiskali. Sarah is a third year law student at Yale. She's a lecturer at in the Education Studies Program, and she's also one of the adult founders of Integrate New York City. And for that reason, Sarah is a living representation of the nexus of research, policy, and practice, which is core to the Ed Studies Program. So thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Mira. Hey, all, this is such a gift to be with you all today. I'd like to kick us off as we tend to do in the youth organizing space with setting some intentions. And so the intentions I've set to, for today and gotten consent from our panelists for are one, to create an intergenerational discussion on self-determined movement building and resistance for integration and structural equity. So what does that mean for you in the audience? And what does that mean for our panelists? It means that I ask that you listen deeply and write questions, comments, ideas when you feel animated or curious. This work does not move without interaction and exchange. 
The second is to build a robust, diverse network of students, organizers, academics, and researchers who elevate students and families to build authentic integration and anti-racist education as they see it so that all people may thrive. To that end, I ask that you consider the unique strengths of each person here. The school integration movement cannot happen with each per without each person here. And consider the ways that you might provide resources, networks, expertise to support anyone here and at the end, when we ask you to take action, I ask that you do it in exchange for the hour that folks here have given with their wisdom and their story. So to kick it off, I would love for our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, uh, name, PGP, the organization you are representing here today, your role in it, and how did you start working in the school integration space? And I'll popcorn it to someone as we tend to do in the organizing space and have uh, them popcorn to someone else. Annette, I will ask you to kick it off for us. Hey y'all, um, my name's Annette. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, I'm part of Integrate NYC. My role is co-founding um, director. And um, the way I got started, I've actually been working with Integrate NYC for five years now. Um, and I got involved through a school exchange that my school did with Bronx Letters. Um, yeah, I'll popcorn it to O'Brien. Hey everybody, my name's O'Brien. Um, pronouns he, him, his. Um, I'm a director and youth coach with Integrate NYC and I got involved three years ago in 2018 um, when I attended a rally for the Fair Play um, Coalition um, regarding sports equity and I've been involved with the work ever since. And I'll popcorn it to Alex. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Alex Rodriguez and my pronouns are open. Um, and I guess you can say my role in Teen Sig Charge is an alumni coach. And um, my involvement with um, youth activism is quite an expansive story, but I guess most simply put, it all started in a conversation with my really good friend, Sokan Jara, in a Forever 21 of all places. And we just started kicking it off and talking about our experiences in school. And then next thing you know, I'm in a wonderful organizing space with other youth um, of color. And then I'll pass it on to Ayana. Hi, my name is Ayanna Smith. My pronoun is she, her, hers. Um, like Alex, I graduated out of Teens Take Charge, so I'm kind of serving as an alumni coach now. I think my story with school integration and just education justice work begins probably in my ninth grade when I learned about the achievement gap. Um, I was really motivated to act and do something about it, but I didn't have a platform at the time. And then one day, one of my close friends said, hey, you should join Teens Take Charge. It seems like it's something to be interested in. And from there, I've been involved in the organization and doing a ton of ed justice work. Matt. Yeah. Uh, I'll go next. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have a chance to speak with all of you this evening. Uh, I'm Matt Delmont, professor of history at Dartmouth College. Um, I guess my uh, involvement with school integration began as an observer, um, uh, involved in the open enrollment program in Minneapolis in the 1980s when I was in elementary school. Um, as a researcher, I'm interested in the history of civil rights and always have been interested in how our schools became segregated and how people fought back against that. Um, so I've done work on uh, Philadelphia, New York City, Boston, Chicago. Um, it's a real pleasure to have a chance to make connections between history and, and the present day on the panel this evening. Back to you, Sarah. Thanks, Matt. So we have incredible blessing of a panel here today. And so I'm really excited to get into things. What I'm curious about is why our audience hasn't asked questions such as, where is this amazing Forever 21 where all of these student organizers begin their careers? Or what is a school exchange? Um, again, given the virtual world that we're in, we're gonna rely on folks to really have active question making. So feel free to start popping those questions in. Um, okay, so my first, the first couple questions and thanks folks for all the questions that are coming in. Um, Professor Debs is gonna be moderating them. Um, they're gonna, the first question is from Mr. Uh, Delmont. Take us back to the New York City activism that you cover in your book, Why Busing Failed. What were the demonstrations of students and parents and how were they covered by the media? 
Thanks, Sarah, for that question. Um, so as Professor Debs mentioned, there was a massive school boycott in 1964, the largest protest in the history of civil rights. 460,000 students stay out of school to protest a school segregation in New York City. And what's interesting about the story in New York is that it really had been going on for a whole decade prior to that. So usually when we were taught about the history of school segregation, school integration, it's usually a Southern story. Uh, but the story of New York City is really a parallel story to that, to the, the Southern story. So in the early 1950s, uh, Ella Baker, the famous civil rights organizer, is the uh, president of the New York branch of the NAACP. Um, and she's working with Kenneth Clark, the famous psychologist, to organize parents and um, civic leaders to really protest the kind of extreme inequality they see in the city's public schools. They know that black and Latinx students are going to schools that are under-resourced. They know that a lot of these uh, textbooks in those schools uh, have racist texts and racist uh, images. Uh, and they want the students to be able to go to schools that have um, equal, equal resources and, and are, are equitable. Um, that happens even before the Brown versus Board decision. Uh, when Brown versus Board is decided by the Supreme Court in 1954, Activists in New York say, why not here, right? The decision is focused on Southern schools, but they see, they look all around, they see that schools in New York are equally segregated and they demand action. They demand action through um, public protests, through editorials, and through statements at school board meetings, because they're trying to bring this issue into the public. Uh, for a lot of folks in New York at that time, they just didn't believe that school segregation, educational inequality could be issues in New York. They thought this is a liberal progressive place. These kind of issues only happen in the South. They can't actually happen in New York City. So they're trying to push it out in the open. In 1957, the same year as the Little Rock school integration crisis, uh, there's a group of mothers in New York who file a lawsuit against the school board to protest educational inequality. And they hold their children out of school for months in protest. Uh, this is a boycott that risks jail time. Uh, and the, the black press dubs them the Harlem Nine. So it's a play on the Little Rock Nine, right? So this is going on at the exact same time what's going on in the South. These protests continue and escalate in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Um, Reverend Milton Glamison and a woman named Annie Stein lead a group called the Parents Workshop for Equality. Um, and they threaten as early as 1960, a large scale boycott. Um, because they're just calling on the school board to do something meaningful to address school segregation. Over this entire period from 1954 to 1964, the school board makes only really small changes. So they might move a few hundred students from an overcrowded school in the Bronx to a less crowded school in Queens. Uh, but mostly the school board drags their feet. They refuse to acknowledge that school segregation is a real issue. They refuse to take any meaningful steps. And even those small scale changes are met with intense resistance from white parents uh, who frankly want to maintain the status quo. They want to maintain racial segregation in the schools. So by February 1964, when this massive school boycott takes place, civil rights activists have been fighting the school board for more than a decade uh, and they have little to show for it. So they're, they're exhausted, they're frustrated and they the, demand that this is the time that action is finally going to take place. Um, that pro boycott itself brings together a coalition of different groups, uh, both kind of more moderate groups, more, more militant groups. Um, it's something that doesn't really get taught in the same way in our, um, our textbooks because the media at the time, particularly the white media, things like the New York Times, disregards that kind of protest. They call it a, a violent uh, act of uh, adult, adult encouraged truancy. And so it's not treated with the same kind of sense of urgency uh, as the civil rights protests are going on in Montgomery, Selma, and Little Rock at the same time. And so I think for me, what's important about that story about school integration and the, the civil rights activism in New York City is that parents, students were intensely organized and they're trying to fight to make this an issue that would be, um, be acknowledged, but the school board at every turn tried to push back and maintain the status quo of segregation. Thanks, Matt. I have another question here and then folks, I'm gonna be turning it over to our uh, student activists here on the panel to ask any follow-up questions. Um, and if not, I'll probably jump into some questions that I'm seeing in the chat. But um, what did people understand the story to be about desegregation? And what would you say is the most important misunderstanding that you wanted to disrupt in your book? Yeah, it's one of the things that fascinates me about this history in, in the North is there's a sense that it was optional. Um, so sometimes people will talk about the history of segregation in North and say it was de facto, um, that it was somehow by custom or by market forces. And this segregation, school segregation in places like New York, Chicago, Boston, it was intentional. Um, the school boards drew zoning lines in ways that would purposely create uh, schools that were predominantly Latino, predominantly white, predominantly African-American. But they did it in such a way that they kind of hid the racist intent of it, uh, which made it very, very difficult to, for activists to bring these cases into court and to actually get justice and to, to finally get some, some actual integration in the schools. So one of the things I tried to show in the book was that these protests over school desegregation um, 
they really needed to, when we think about them in the North, we need to think about them with the same sense of moral urgency as we tend to think about school segregation in the South. That the over the years, the debate has really been um, switched in such a way that it, all of the focus becomes on the perspectives and the desires of white parents. Whereas when we're talking about school integration, what we should be focusing on is the rights and educational outcomes uh, for black and Latinx students. Thanks, Matt. Um, do any of our student activists here have any questions? I feel like Matt in particular brought up some of the untold stories of um, mostly black and Puerto Rican student organizers in New York City. Um, anyone wanna ask any questions? I had a question, Matt, that I wanted to follow up on. Why do you feel like it's often such an untold story that the largest civil rights demonstration was a half million black and Puerto Rican students in New York? What do you think is driving that story not being covered and not being made front and center at the time when it happened and today? Because I'm sure a lot of people on this call are like, wait a minute, let me fact check that. The largest civil rights demonstration was black and Puerto Rican students in New York City. I don't think that's right. Yeah, I think the reason it didn't get attention at the time and the reason it hasn't gotten much attention until uh, recently um, is that it's it's a more uncomfortable and difficult story for a lot of people, particularly folks in the North, to, to reckon with. Um, what I mean by that is it was easier for, people, for white folks in 1964, where that's the parents, the school board, or, or media, to point to places in the South and say, well, that's, that's bad things that are happening in the South. That's where racism exists. It exists down in Montgomery and down in Selma. It can't possibly exist in New York. In, in New York. That's... To actually think about the history honestly, uh, it forces people to reckon with the, the privilege they have in their own neighborhoods in terms of housing, in terms of schools, uh, and it actually forces them to give up something. Um, so one of the things that Martin Luther King would always say when he came to speak in New York City and other places in New York was that white liberals and white moderates had to actually live up to their ideals. Right? It wasn't enough to be liberal when we're talking about race just in the South. You had to be liberal when it actually came to your own neighborhood and to your own backyard. I mean, I think that was true in the 60s. I think it's true today. It's, it's hard. There's a, a willful ignorance that a lot of people would like to have about the realities of racism in our country. And I think that's particularly true in places that people want to think of as being somehow more progressive or more liberal. Um, it, it allows them to not deal with the, um, the actual reality of how race is structured in our country. I actually have one follow-up question for you, and then I'm going to pass it along to folks here. I heard you say asking folks to be liberal in their own neighborhoods. It almost sounds to me like the word liberal and anti-racist are being interchanged in that, in that statement. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit more for me around how you understand conservatism versus liberalism in this conversation and when they do and don't um, become words that can be replaced with one another? Sure, that, that's a, a big question. So think about the, the time period I'm studying, the historical time period. Um, conservatives would have been more directly outspoken and say, I'm thinking of folks like Barry Goldwater, the senator from Arizona, who was explicitly opposed to the Civil Rights Act, right? He, he didn't, he thought it was unconstitutional. He didn't think that the government had a role to play in, um, in promoting integration. So I think conservatives in that time period were, were more vocal in their opposition. Liberals, white liberals in this case, had a position where they would say they were in favor of integration generally, um, but when push came to shove, they did everything they could to not actually integrate their own neighborhoods and their own schools. Um, and so I think that's a, a sort of a structuring reality about how um, white liberalism has functioned in our country is that it's liberal in sort of general strokes, but not actually uh, in practice when it actually comes to things that directly impact people's lives. Um, the term anti-racist didn't exist in the sort of 60s, but I think part of what King was calling for was people to be proactive, to take the action the actions that would follow up on their, their ideals, right? And so I think to transpose it into the present, I think the, the kind of things we see taking place in New York City right now, right, it's doesn't do much good to say you're in favor of educational equality if you're not actually going to support, proactively support the policies and the steps that are gonna produce those outcomes on the ground. Thanks so much, folks. Um, I'm gonna move to our Integrate NYC and Teams Take Charge folks, um, but wanna give folks here an opportunity to possibly ask any questions, any follow-up to Matt. Okay, um, I also just wanna shout out, I see a lot of folks in the chat from Integrated Schools, uh, such a blessing to be with you all today. 
Um, so I want to first start off, you know, Matt talks a lot in his book about busing and how busing becomes the thing that people talk about is segregation and is the issue around immigration. And that's the real issue and why we have to remain segregated. I'm wondering if we could start maybe with Integrate NYC first and talking about in 2014 and 2015, when y'all first started, how was, what was the busing of the time? What was the thing that people told you integration was? Um, and what were the ways that you had to really push against that to create the five R's? Um, I think busing was still a thing for us, like maybe not busing, busing, but just like the movement of bodies and maybe like enrollment was only talked about when we first started and the quick solution was sort of seen as well, if we just make the schools look different, that will solve the problem. Or if we make them look desegregated, that will solve the problem. But I don't think um, the people making this policy, well, it's not, I don't think, I know that the people making this policy didn't think about what students um, felt and experienced every single day because as students, it was so obvious for us to see that um, enrollment wasn't the only issue and enrollment wasn't, the only solution either. Um, and so that's why when we began our youth councils and meeting with students all across um, the five boroughs, we created the five R's. Um, we, we will be first like talked about our experiences. And I saw somebody ask like what a school exchange is. And um, for us, it's basically like when you like buddy up with someone in the other school, you know, you have a group of, of students kind of buddying each other up and you take each other through the through your day in your school. And for all of us, that community and relationship work was really important um, because it allowed us to see each other's experiences and then have similar conversations with other students from other schools around the city. And um, that's kind of how we came about our 5R platform, which is race and enrollment. So yes, let's let's address um, race and enrollment, right? And actually name like race and what are, what are other factors that we are taking into account when enrolling students, because that shouldn't be the only thing. Um, and like, how do we use those factors to like benefit students rather than like penalize them um, for stuff that has happened in their lives? We have um, resources, which talks about how like, resources are are allocated um, inequitably across like schools. Some schools get 20 sports teams, other schools get zero. Some schools get three science labs, others get like broken lab equipment. Um, and we talk about representation, which talks about like um, how, which really addresses that like a lot of our, um, our teachers and a lot of the people who are teaching us stuff and, and like in front of the classroom are white and don't look like most black and brown like students um, and, and like don't really like are not able to identify and connect with them in that way. So like how, how are we addressing that issue as well? Um, we talk about relationships, which is like, okay, once we're all in the building and we're um, in a diversified space, like, what does that mean? Like, how do we build relationships together? Like how we're not just gonna ignore like all the tension and like the history of like trauma that our families, like our individual families are and our individual bodies have gone through. And we also have restorative justice, which, um, it's the last hour, empty breath. <laughs> There's five hours. Um, and I also want to invite O'Brien if you want to add anything for in those hours. Uh, our last one is restorative justice, which deals with um, um, the school to prison pipeline, which like shows that a lot of our students and especially our black and brown students are being like locked up and are being isolated from um, maybe perhaps the only institution that could give them like a meet, like, like any kind of stability. Um, and, and so like what, what does restorative justice look like and how do we like really build um, a community where, where we can learn from our mistakes and not like punish students, especially like our black and brown students. Thanks so much, Annette. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit from Teens Take Charge about the way that you've disrupted media and the way that you've used new media, new ways to address media, the way that the podcast has done that and really shifted um, the, the way that young people are, like Matt was saying, pushed to the side in the narrative about integration. What are the innovative ways that you've really transformed how students are centered um, in mainstream media? 
Yeah, I think Matt brings up a really good point um, when talking about how the North has was kind of seen as this like holy grail. Um, and to this day, it's like very much, uh, we see a lot of, dare I say, like neocolonization of terms like progressive and um, Democrat or liberal. And what we find is a lot of parents, especially parents who are opposed to integration, um, kind of use these as almost shields to protect them from their own racist tendencies when talking about education. And so what Teen Take Charge has been doing a lot of is trying to infiltrate as much of the media as possible to kind of make these problems known. It's been swept under the rug for literally decades, right? Um, and we know that like, if there's anything that our generation can do is completely infiltrate the media. And so we made sure to center as much student voices as possible because those are undisputable, at least I'd hope to be, right? And so with the podcast, you know, we're um, talking about the in-person experiences that different students have at different um, underfunded institutions and things like that. That's one way. We've been so fortunate to have um, plenty, like a couple of documentaries um, about student experiences and their different um, intersectional experiences about living in a extremely segregated school system, but also just like things like Instagram and Twitter. Um, that has also been really fundamental at educating, you know, our following, our followers, you know, and reaching all over the place because, I mean, it's everywhere, right? How can we engage with our audience in a more personal level um, when we do these types of like um, media campaigns, hashtags and things like that as well? Yeah. Um, wow. Every time I hear about the media, I just get really excited. Um, as Teens Take Charge's former co-director of press, because I like that was my life for um, the year that I was involved in an organization before graduating. And I feel like in my experience, adding on to what Alex said, definitely the media has been important in steering the conversation and bringing light to it. But I feel like um, at least when I published my first op-ed, it was a really like personal experience. I remember walking into school the next day and my principal like stopping me in the hallway and asking me about like school integration in my work and like praising my op-ed. Um, and she shared it with other teachers and students within the school and that started a school-wide discussion about like school integration for around a week or so. And like every time I published something where it was featured in something, um, students and teachers together, we'd kind of just learn from each other's experiences when we had the free time to engage in that. Um, so storytelling is definitely a big part of youth organizing around school integration. And um, it really does like start conversations and allows people to like change the narratives and um, come together and just like create a new understanding and vision for education in the future. So, yeah. Thank you so much. I have a conversation. I've appreciated a couple of comments in the chat because oftentimes what people are looking at is what's in the media but not knowing about what's actually in the movement and the way that we have to work to heal each other and support each other. And so um, I wanted to get more on a personal level um, to really give folks here, this is a form of media arguably, right? Um, the opportunity to, to just really appreciate what the folks here are, are doing and the, and the many lonely challenging moments outside of the exciting meetings or the inspiring time at Forever 21, there's a lot of lonely times when you wonder, do I wanna take that risk? Do I wanna deal with people on the internet making racial slurs at me? Do I wanna deal with my classmates or parents putting me down? And so I'd like to ask this first question. It comes from uh, one of our students who said, what is a moment that you felt segregation in your body, that you actually felt the experience? What did it feel like? Where were you? And would you be willing to share a little bit with the group here? I can go first. Um, so I went to a specialized high school. I went to Brooklyn Technical High School. Um, and, you know, that school is like, quote unquote, the most diverse specialized high school. But um, the representation for students like myself as an Afro-Latino, is like almost zero to none. So I think that like, you know, it's common at least for like um, black students, for Latinx students to like, you know, gather in different um, meetings in different spaces. So for instance, there's like the BSU, which is the Black Student Union, as well as ASPIRA, which is um, 
this club that's uh, a quote unquote an investment in Latino youth and Latinx youth. And I think that like, you know, it's a very alienating, it's a very like lonely space to navigate, especially in a specialized high school with more than like 6,000 plus students. And where you only see a very small percentage of that 6,000 student mass being students that look like you. Um, to add on to that, um, you know, I never, I, I don't think I, I can recall or I can count on the, with the fingers on my hand how many teachers I've had that are, we're teachers of color, we're teachers that look like me. And like all of that speaks to the different um, R's and the different platforms that we work with at Integrate NYC. But I feel like, you know, I also had privilege privileges when it came to that. So I went to a New York City specialized high school. So I had access to all the different APs. I had access to 40 plus sports teams. I had access to like a whole freaking um, plane flight navigator in on like in the school building. And to, to know that like there's students that don't even have a cafeteria to sit and have lunch at. There's students that don't have any access to sports teams. There's students that, you know, there's home, houseless students, there's students in the foster care system, and, like, there's people that are coming from all these different backgrounds, and, like, you know, to step into a building where you're already not really welcomed, you're not really represented in the curriculum, I feel like it's something that we all deal with, but, like, for me personally, like, it's, like, I go to Howard University now where I have Black educators and I learn about my history and about Black history, but... I would have never done that if had if it would have been in the New York City public school system. I would have never had access to these type of things. And I never really had people that looked like me around me. So I was always like kind of on my own. And like, you know, that's like there's several different instances. I can't just name one where I just felt like the segregation present. But like, you know, it's real and it exists. And like I was going through that and I didn't realize that I was going through that at the time until I started working with Integrate NYC. Well, Brian, thanks so much for sharing that. I really heard in his sharing about the experience of loneliness and the experience of just um, really feeling torn between trying to get an opportunity and trying to support your community. And I'm wondering if anyone else here on the panel has felt things like loneliness or feeling torn. Are there other feelings that are present for you as young people who have lived through segregation and lived through this largest segregated school system in the United States. Yeah, I mean, it like O'Brien was sharing, it's almost hard to kind of just pinpoint one experience because I think we grow up in these school systems and we kind of get so used to being in these very um, kind of microcosmic environments that you don't really necessarily recognize, hey, like I'm living in a segregated school system, especially if what you're learning in school and history always puts away the focus from New York City and, and your experiences onto the South. You know, it, it almost serves as kind of like this crazy scapegoat um, that prevents, you know, often, you know, the white history teachers from looking into themselves in a way that they also segregate students within their own classrooms, right? Um, and I guess one thing that I can share is I think my school, I went to predominantly black and brown Title I school in Brooklyn. And one of, you know, the things that my school tried to do to give access to a lot of resources to its students is kind of send them on enrichment programs outside of the school, you know, so kind of going to different parts of the city and engaging in different types of you know, activities and extracurriculars um, that the school just couldn't offer in-house. And a lot of the times they would send uh, the students into very, very white and wealthy spaces. Um, and one that comes to mind is a model Congress that I went to um, around the 10th grade. And it was probably one of the most jarring experiences that I've ever really had um, because I didn't really know there were white students in New York City for a really long time. Um, because I grew up like in the little Caribbean, like I like went to black and brown schools pretty much all my life. And so to then go to a model Congress, which is very like a showboaty type thing, you know, and then to see that like out of like, I don't know, 200, 300 students, my school's the only delegation composed of entirely students of color. Like it was the most jarring thing to ever see. And I was often, you know, the only person of color like within just a room, you know? Um, and that is when I started to get hit with all these classic experiences that I'm sure a lot of people here 
would uh, relate to, you know, the microaggressions, you know, even incidents of just overt racism, um, very gatekeeper-esque language, um, and things like that. And so I think from there on out, I started to become way more cognizant of just all the experiences. It kind of started to hit me, like, a lot at the same time. And it took me some time to also just heal from that trauma that I had to endure um, in in conferences like that from there on out. Um, yeah, I think it's um, a really interesting question. I think like we're constantly living in a segregated society, right? So even if like some of us have graduated high school, I think all of us have, um, like we still stepped into um, uh, most of us are like stepping into um, segregated higher education institutions and even like outside like education institutions like we do live um, in a in a segregated um, space I guess um, and it, it is challenging I feel like um, throughout the time and throughout our, our work like we we've gained like the the language to like maybe like tell our story and like be like okay this is happening and like how to name that um and that has like in itself been like hard like learning how to like name like your story and how to like like tell it it's like a real process and um I think like we also feel like a lot of imposter syndrome like even in our organizing spaces I feel like maybe that's like the loneliest I've ever heard, like felt like when imposter syndrome kind of starts creeping in and like there's not like one time that it happened and then that's it I feel like it have it has happened throughout my life um where like um I just you you feel like because of who you are like you don't you don't belong in that space or like you look around you or, or, or um in my particular experience like I was always like how they say like cherry picked to be in like AP classes or like honor classes and like um, it was always like a jarring experience to like look around you and see like only like like one other person or two other people that like look like you um, and I feel like even in organizing right like I remember when we first started out Integrate NYC like we did like this video project type of thing and um I I started this work with like um, my white peer who also went to the same school as I did and I remember like we were both in the video and then like when we um, came out of that like we were standing together but people were like going up to her and asking her questions about like what segregation means and like what integration mean and what and what like integrating NYC like, is about and so like I feel like it's really like it can be like lonely to see how um, how maybe like people perceive you. I don't know about lonely, but it's just like exhausting, you know? And like, although we are activists and we're organizers, like we can't constantly be having like the energy to have like, to stop and like have a conversation with someone and like try to change their whole perspective. So I think like um, learning how to like build our boundaries and or like me, like learning how to build my boundaries has like been um, really important in like not having like, those like lonely moments or like imposter syndrome moments and like knowing that like I don't have to be perfect and also that like my community is here with me. Um, I'm still trying to like formulate a response to that question because I definitely felt like a lot to um, process and think about and I feel like in my organizing experience, I didn't necessarily feel loneliness. Um, throughout my entire K through 12 experience, I've only really existed in spaces that were predominantly black and Latinx students. Um, so I definitely didn't feel that sense of isolation in terms of my race or ethnicity. Um, and I, but I feel like a lot of what I had to experience related to organizing was definitely unpacking um, things like internalized racism, um, internalized sexism and other traumas that come with being a member of um, a BIPOC group. Um, and that in itself has been extremely uncomfortable. And I remember like when I first started out at Teens Take Charge, I was often questioning my commitment um, and questioning like whether or not this was a mission that I could get behind. Um, but I realized that that process mostly is about kind of self-exploration and self-discovery. Um, and it also definitely connected to feelings of fear whenever I did like publish things or like spoke in public to people. 
Um, because like once you say something or it's out in the world, you can't necessarily take that back. Um, so like feeling, having to feel like affirmed and confident in what I was saying and believing in myself in terms of that. Um, but yeah, sorry if the response was like unclear. I'm still trying to like think about it. I feel like that was so powerful what you just said, um, especially the piece about not being able to take it back and taking that risk every time. So thank you for taking the risk again here on this panel. I appreciate you. Matt, I was wondering as these incredible organizers were speaking, what stood out to you the most? Um, and what's a question you have for them or something that you think is just really worth elevating? Because I feel like they said so much and I'd love to hear just what's going on for you. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a, a dozen things. I mean, one of the first ones is just thinking about how this doesn't stop after high school, right? So I think all of you are in college up, and I don't know where everyone's at, but I think probably mostly at primary white institutions. Uh, I'm at Dartmouth. I'm a full professor and encounter a lot of the same things that you all are describing. Um, and, and that's what you're talking about, um, sort of feeling like you're cherry picked to sort of be one of the handful of people like that. That's verbatim the experience of most faculty of color, right, at, at these at these institutions now. Um, and I think when you sort of think about what it means to sort of to live reality of segregation, it means that you're constantly encountering people who um, are discovering these things anew for the first time. I think that's part of the summer of 2020, right? Is for a lot of people, it was um, an eye-opening experience about sort of the depths of racism, depths of police brutality. Um, for a lot of communities of color, it was another summer. Um, and so I think that strikes me the importance of kind of trying to teach and um, bring these stories to the fore. The thing I'd love to know more from you all is um, there's a question in the in the chat from um, Alex uh, up, uh, Upsahi. Um, talking about what teachers can do to support teen activists. Um, and so I, I, in you, I see a lot of my own students of color here on campus. So could you reflect on, for your thing about yourselves in high school, think about yourselves now in college, what does it mean for um, when you're working with teachers, what would you like to see teachers do um, in the classroom to support you, either in terms of how they're structuring uh, lessons or teaching about histories, what histories would have helped you to know when you were in junior high and high school, or just in terms of structuring conversations and, um, and making space for centering your voices and your experiences. Um, I would love to learn from you as, a, as an educator. I guess I can go. Um, I mean, that's a loaded question. I guess um, kind of one of the best things that I had, like when I was organizing um, in high school, there were definitely um, people in my school that were not in full support of um, everything that I was doing with um, my colleagues at Teens Take Charge and Integrate NYC. And that was probably one of the most mentally taxing things to have to go through um, when you are kind of in the authority of somebody else who clearly is not in support, um, which is also just very jarring for me to see because um, like a lot of people mentioned, you know, you're often in these primarily black and brown schools where teachers who are bearing dominant identities. Um, and I guess the biggest thing that teachers um, did for me that were um, supporting me were just settling time to talk and just talk through um, emotions, things that you're feeling, checking in on you. Um, and I think, of course, like being, you know, lenient on like certain types of things or like your also emotional capacity and just uh, passing on their wisdom as well, especially teachers of color who have to also um, deal with um, people who are above them in a sense um, with their jobs and but also have to manage their own emotional um, kind of states when they're working in institutions like this. Um, and I guess the biggest um, kind of thing that I can say is just also be open to learn. I think a lot of um, places that I, you know, have been a student in, there's almost this kind of like teacher student dynamic where the teacher feels like they just have to, you know, inculcate everything they know into the student. And you miss a lot of, um, you know, value in, in the student's experience. I think um, learning should be a two way street. Um, the teacher should also be the student and the student should also be the teacher um, and honoring that you don't have to relate to every single experience your teacher, your student has, right? Um, and so kind of guiding that as well. Thanks so much. I know that we're gonna now open it up to our um, audience here because we have about 
hopefully like a hundred students, parents, organizers in the audience whose voices we'd love to hear as well. Um, and so I'd love to elevate some of their questions here. Um, I believe, okay. We have a question here, which is um, specifically looking at white parents in school districts. Um, I know that there's an organization represented here that's working to also organize white parents. And I know Matt's book speaks specifically about the resistance of white parents. And you all have really talked about the microaggressions that you've experienced. Um, what, are, what are some actions that you think white parents and white students can take as allies in this work? Um, if you were to um, talk about what allyship looks like and if allyship isn't enough, what being a co-conspirator looks like. Um, I think this is also a really interesting question. Uh, I think I, I was gonna say this with the teacher question too. I think like the first most important thing um, to do is to listen. Like we can sit here and tell y'all our experiences and like what our teachers might have done or like what our white allies might have done, but this comes from like our community. So I think like first thing is to like really listen um, to what your community is saying and to like what your young people are saying um, or the young people in, in, in your spaces are. And then like, sort of be brave with that, um, especially if you hold like a position where um, you have like institutional power or like like any type of power where like people are listening to you because like a lot of the times administration is not listening to students. So I think it's really important to like be brave with young people. A lot of time I hear that like, um, young people are like organizers because they're not like afraid because like we don't have anything to lose but I think we're like we fight really hard because we have everything to lose um so I think but I think like being brave with us right like like um not just listening to us and like making a space for us like I, I think um something that that my one of my um teachers in my school did and what I wish like the white parents um and like the white students in my school would have done is like take um like have meetings with my principal like I think like one of those like the the like yeah so so my teacher had like we, we all had like a teach like a, a meeting with with our principal it was like the respect for all coalition in my school and like my my teacher she's she's Ecuadorian like me and she was like the first Ecuadorian and Latina teacher that I I, I ever had um my educational career and she just like she, she was brave for us like you know like like we said like all of these things are missing and and she she voiced that to us to our principal and like our principal didn't re even really like have like the words although he like made excuses but that like taking a stance is really important um and like taking like up that space that you know you can take up to have the conversations that we're saying need to happen um, is really important and sort of like taking, like giving back power to like, you know, it doesn't belong to you, like give back the power to like the young people. Yeah, um, I definitely want to underscore Annette's point about amplifying the work that already exists um, and work being done by primary stakeholders of the issue. Um, and I think also it's really important to make a distinction between allyship and then like performative allyship. Um, and I personally define performative allyship as people who kind of just engage within social justice work just for like popularity um, or likes on Instagram. And I guess to com combat that is definitely making sure your interactions within the, um, organizing spaces are meaningful and intentional. Um, and you're kind of just really engaged in what's happening and also committing um, and kind of just being there at your your full capacity at all times. Um, if someone wants to elaborate on that. Thanks, Ayana. Um, this is a question for Matt from the audience. Could you please situate the youth of color in the 1960s? Did they form independent and distinct groups in this movement, even if in partnerships with adults? 
Yes. So the um, I mean, there's multiple different uh, forms of organizing, some um, kind of more clearly codified. So youth councils with the NAACP and with other organizations. Um, and then there were more kind of informal organizing that would happen at the, the high school level um, where people just kind of recognize that this was something that was that they want to take action on. Um, so it happened um, both sort of just inter within youth and then more kind of intergenerational with with parents as well. Um, sometimes organized around churches and other civic organizations. Um, I think the important thing was that it was consistent ongoing organization um, from young people. It was, it was creative. It was um, relentless, um, like a lot of the organizing today. Um, and it was widespread across across the city. Right. So you, you don't get 460,000 students stay out of school without a huge amount of coordination and without people um, uh, really dedicating themselves to that, uh, to that, to that work. Um, so I think that those are kind of connections between uh, then and now. You know, I'd also like to pop in here too and add that what we understand to be integration when we look retrospectively back, you know, when Annette's saying, we don't want to focus just on the movement of bodies, right? So something that we did, the five-point platform on real integration, I'm sure anyone here who's seen a pamphlet or read a book about the Black Panthers or the Young Lords knows about a multi-point multi, -plot, a multi -point platform by youth of color. We studied the Young Lords uh, platforms. We studied the Black Panthers when we were doing the five R's. And so I just want to name that because when our students were reclaiming integration and reclaiming what real integration was, it wasn't that they were making that up. They were integrating youth movements over the course of time. And the Young Lords and the Black Panthers have been historically criminalized and situated as, um, I think it not not situated in the same way as integration organizers, situated as some sort of controversial groups. Um, and something that we've tried to make very clear is that the, the Black Panthers and the Young Lords are as controversial as folks who were organizing for traditional forms of integration. There are benefits and disadvantages to all of the different platforms. And so that's been something that we've been making sure um, to name. I'd love to end today's panel. We're, we're mostly organizers and activists here. And so I'd love to end today's panel with um, a call to action for folks. And so I just love um, if all our participants could just like ground themselves and, and listen in and tune in. And we really believe in reciprocity in the movement. And so each of our students here um, and hopefully Matt and Mira will share one kind of action that they think you can take to elevate their work, excuse me, or to elevate the movement for school integration. And I'd ask each participant to just pledge in the chat what they're going to do. Um, and so I'm going to first um, hand it over to Teens Take Charge, who has a summit this weekend. Um, Y'all want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so Teen Stake Charge is um, planning a nationwide summit um, on Saturday um, with, um, we're calling it Activist X Academics, um, which is really a partnership between ac um, activists in New York City, um, as well as academics across um, the country. Um, and so we have people like Gary Orfield um, coming up to speak with us. We have um, Joanne Boyce, um, who is moderating um, a panel with the wonderful Tiffany and Sophie. I don't know if you've um, read their work before. And so uh, thank you, Sarah, for putting um, the registration link in the chat. So yeah, please check it out um, and feel free to look um, and, and see if this is something you'd be interested in. It's completely um, free for youth. Um, and then we're asking for adults if you can donate whatever you can um, to support the youth um, activists that are going to be on these panels. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, I'm also going to just share a quick intro to Integrate, and then we're going to dive into actually a very Yale-centered um, opportunity here with one of our organizers. But Integrate NYC, we are always looking, just like Team Stick Charge sh shared, of, for resources and expertise and networks to elevate and support our student organizers. And this is a university just teeming with resources. So if you have a resource, a network, an idea, please, I ask that you click that link and you send us a contact. Um, you send us an email in our contact and share it with us. It takes about 30 seconds, but could really make a difference. But now this is a really exciting opportunity. I'm gonna hand it over to Annette and O'Brien, 
who are going to elevate one of our youth organizers who's actually a student here at Yale who's building out a university network to bring grassroots movements to the university space, just like Matt said, is so needed. So Annette O'Brien, you want to share a little bit about that opportunity? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, it's currently in the works is um, called Integrate You, which is being spearheaded by Joaquin Soto. He's a currently a first year student here at Yale. And um, the project is basically aiming to uplift and integrate NYC's youth develop frameworks and to further contribute their um, integrationist initiatives at the university level. And it's really about creating like a, a networking level across educational platforms and really working to like, you know, move around resources and build collaboration and contact. Um, and if you guys are interested in working that out, please reach out to Joaquin. I know we can also put his email in the chat, but um, Integrate You is the next big thing. I'm going to put um, Joaquin's uh, info in the chat. Um, anything else, folks, here that we'd like to plug? All right, so what I'd like to do um, in the way that we end all of our meetings um, in most intergenerational organizing spaces is just an opportunity um, for acknowledgement. And so um, I can start with acknowledging someone um, and then have them um, pop over to someone else. Um, I wanna first acknowledge Ayana. Um, Ayana, I loved your comment about not being able, the risk of not being able to take something back. Um, and what a risk that is for young people who are navigating the media and sharing their story. So popcorning an affirmation to you and asking you to pick it up and affirm someone here. And folks in the chat, if you could affirm someone too in the chat, that would be great. Yeah, um, I think I wanna affirm Annette because I feel like I really resonated with her experience, particularly um, the classroom connections type thing. That's something I participated in when I was in high school too. And I found it really informative. So it's always nice meeting people with shared experiences. And in general, um, I feel like if like she weren't participating, it'd be really hard for me to formulate my own responses. And I feel like I took a lot of inspiration um, from her responses. So I'll popcorn it to her next. Um. Thank you so much, Ayana. Um, shout out to you as well. And shout out to all the panelists, because like, um, I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna shout out Orion, acknowledge Orion specifically, because I feel like you made the most faces. <laughs> but everyone in this space and all of your faces and reactions, like really, like, I'm, I'm such a relationships gal. So making, seeing that I could like make y'all laugh or like just get a reaction was, I really felt connected um, in this virtual setting. So Thank you for being in this space with me. And I'll pass it to O'Brien. Oh, thank you. I feel gassed. Um, I want to acknowledge Alex. I think that Alex did a would like powerfully convey like every single idea. Like when I was answering the question, I was like, damn, Alex like perfectly said that. And I wish I would have like went after because then maybe I could have stolen a little bit of information and inspiration from Alex. So I'll popcorn it to Alex. Oh, thank you, Ryan. Um, yeah, I guess um, I guess my um, affirmation goes to Matt. Thank you for bringing this kind of academic um, perspective in all of this, especially kind of helping us uncover um, the untold um, stories about school integration. I think it's much, much needed, especially when talking about how kind of all of the issues in American life is kind of highlighted on the South when oftentimes it's really just looking at yourself and your own privileges and, and the regions that you are in um, that really kind of can foster the most change. So thank you for bringing that perspective on this panel. Thanks, Alex. Um, I want to compliment all my fellow panelists. I've been following uh, the work that um, Teen Shake Charge and Integrate NYC have been doing uh, from, from far via social media and um, online. So it's a pleasure to have a chance to talk with all, all of you. Um, I want to thank uh, Mira for bringing everyone together and Sarah for doing such a great job of moderating. Um, I think the specific one, um, um, O'Brien, I think what you were saying about sort of going to a school and sort of recognizing sort of the access that you had to certain things while also recognizing the sort of vast inequalities across the system really resonated with me and just how uh, we're always kind of positioned in these vast networks of, of um, privilege and inequality in ways that um, aren't fully under our control, but we 
try to navigate them and, and change them for the better. Um, so thanks, Sarah, I pop form back to you now. Thank you all. And Mira, appreciate you for creating this space. Um, you know, Annette talked about being brave and creating spaces that haven't been done before. Um, and so building out spaces for activists to um, create research and create panels um, and to be honored at the in the same space as um, folks who are seen as scholars, regardless of educational access is important. Um, and so thank you for being part of organizing this. It took weeks, months. Um, so appreciate y'all. Um, so folks have a beautiful evening and I ask everyone, all participants, please um, attend Teens Take Charge Summit this weekend. Contact Integrate NYC with a resource, concept, idea, and please, 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 if you are a Yale student, reach out to Joaquin Soto and be a part of bringing this work to Yale University. Have a beautiful evening.